Hello, my name is Tammy Rose and welcome to Concord Days. It is a blessed thing to be a mother, Julia Ward Howe wrote, but there are bounds to all things and no woman is under any obligation to sacrifice the whole of her existence to the mere act of bringing children into the world. Men on the contrary, think it glorification enough for a woman to be a wife and a mother in any way and upon any terms. That's from the Civil Wars of Julia Ward Howe. And today I'm very pleased to present uh, Dr. Tiffany Wayne, uh, who is an amazing author who's written several really great books on women in the 19th century and beyond. Hi, Tiffany, how you doing? Great, thanks for having me, Tammy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I will say right up front that you and I have met at the Thoreau Annual Gathering, and we've, I think, cemented our friendship over the book discussion group on Transcendentalist 2021. Yes, one of the one of the benefits of the lockdown time is our weekly discussions now via Zoom. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's, it's been fun. We have an amazing little yeah. group and we we get to sort of talk about all the all the characters that we're meeting um, from the Transcendentalist group and beyond. And, uh, and I'm actually really pleased to have you on today because you specifically wanted to, we wanted to both discuss women's rights, um, like not just having to do with the Transcendentalist, but sort of beyond the realm of Concord, mm -hmm. right? Um, so first of all, like, so actually, so, so let, let's continue on this thread of just, <laughs> you know, like just being being women in this in this world. So how how did you actually get um, hit? How did you start with the the transcendentalist or even like Henry David Thoreau? Or how did you start doing this kind of research? Um, yeah, so um, I actually I actually didn't even start out in history, like as far as an academic field of study, I was a women's studies major as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And I studied so much about the theory of feminism and feminism today that I just, I took a women's history class as an undergraduate um, with a fabulous historian who I'm still connected with. And I was like, oh, in order to understand anything about anything, insert your topic here, I need to know more about the history of it. So I became really obsessed with learning about the history of feminism, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in this country, in the United States. So that women's history class led to me thinking about doing a PhD in history and studying women's history. And I am in California, I'm in the Santa Cruz area and I was at UC Santa Cruz for my uh, doctoral program. And, you know, my advisor was like, I had to do a master's thesis and my advisor was like, oh, well, you know, find a local woman. So um, I'm out here in Santa Cruz. So I found this local woman named Georgiana Bruce Kirby who had lived here in Santa Cruz and she was the wife of a rancher. And, you know, turns out there's all kinds of Kirby things all over Santa Cruz. And I wrote my master's thesis on her. And long story short, she had lived at Brook Farm at the Utopian community in Massachusetts um, in the 1840s. And mm -hmm. yeah, and then in the 1850s, she had migrated to Santa Cruz um, with the person she married. And so um, she was like, you know, she wrote a lot about this. Uh, she had these diaries. And so in a really roundabout way, um, through Kirby, I wanted to learn more about Brook Farm. My PhD advisor was an early Americanist who, um, who specialized in Massachusetts, um, but in the earlier period. And so, you know, she said, well, maybe you should find out more about, you know, who was at Brook Farm. And so I thought I would do something about women involved in the utopian communities, but I ended up finding out so much more about the wider transcendentalist circles and of course about Margaret Fuller, um, whom a lot had been written about by a lot of great scholars. And so I just started looking at the women who were kind of quoting and, and thinking about Margaret Fuller and carrying her ideas forward. And so that's how I got from Santa Cruz <laughs> to Brook Farm to the Transcendentalist uh, and, and to the history of feminism really. And so I just became really interested in in women's rights in the 19th century women's rights as an intellectual movement you yeah. know how were these ideas spreading how was feminism sort of filtering through uh people's perspectives in these other literary and philosophical movements and uh and finding some key women writers um julia ward howe was one of them i wrote a little bit about her um who were trying to be women and mothers and thinkers and writers at that time which yeah. i was also trying to be because while I was in grad school, 
I gave birth to two children. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> are now, yeah, <laughs> we're yes. now college age, uh, but uh, one was born right in the middle of my program <laughs> and one was born at the very end. Um, she, she beat out my dissertation deadline. I had to do an extra quarter. <laughs> <laughs> So I was really interested in, you know, and I didn't end up writing about motherhood, but I was writing about women's history and I was finding all of these women thinkers and writers who um, also had that very practical, how do we do this? How do you be a thinker and a writer um, and participate in intellectual life when like how said you, you know, you have domestic duties and you have children. Exactly. Which you also enjoy. <laughs> exactly. And even Margaret Fuller had a child as well. Yes. At the end yes. Of her life. So I feel yes. like there's this, there's this weird sense of like, especially in the 19th century that you have to either be a spinster and like that mm -hmm. is also a very particular role because you, you age out of the whole idea of being a pretty young woman into a caretaker. And right. if you're not a right. caretaker, you know, for, you know, your own children, then somehow you're going to get um, like, I want to say hornswaggled into you know, taking care <laughs> of other people's children or something like that. Right. And it was like, you know, you could be a wife and a mother or, um, you know, even Emerson had this quote about women as, you know, as wives or as muses. And, um, you know, I was just more interested in like women trying to figure out their own intellectual life, but influenced by the whole, you know, by Emerson, by Thoreau, uh, by Alcott, um, all of whom, you know, especially Emerson and Alcott, um, you know, had women very close to them who participated in all of their intellectual activities. And so I started teasing that out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, and so let's talk about that. Um, so, so, so I feel like the transcendentalists themselves um, really focused on, um, you know, trying to figure out the rights of everybody. And mm -hmm. you know, Emerson, Emerson was very much like, you know, uh, self-reliance. How do you, how do you respect yourself? How do you, um, really not not think about how to um, you know how to how to how to lean on li like the older world and whatever it's like let's 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 figure out everything in the moment um, but right. it didn't always translate to other people of different mm -hmm. classes or stations or whatever in society and I feel like it certainly didn't translate easily into women um, until he you know faced Margaret Fuller right and then right. Uh, Margaret Fuller did her conversations which I feel like opened it up to her larger society. Right. Yes, and Fuller's Fuller's conversations are really like the intellectual starting point for like my story about uh, mm -hmm. women intellectuals because um, you know they so many women uh, were came into her circle through that and and went from there. Um, but I wanted to go back to what you were saying about the transcendentalist kind of reform project. And it was always this big dilemma, right? For transcendentalism, it's a big intellectual dilemma. Uh, and one of the key themes of Emerson's works is self versus society, and you know the individual in society, and um, and self reliance, like you said. And it it posed a really big intellectual uh, dilemma in the 19th century because were women even in individuals, right? Did women have an individual self, and what does that mean? And women's relationship to society is a different than, you know, men's relationship at that time, especially someone in Emerson's position. Um, and so the whole title of my dissertation, which became that book, Woman Thinking, was a play on Emerson's um, phrase about the man, you know, in the ideal state is man thinking, mm. uh, like as an active, as an activity. And so I went with, uh, you know, woman thinking, because I'm not sure that a lot of 19th century um, intellectuals could conceive that women were individual selves <laughs> with individual thoughts. And you're right that Fuller challenged a lot of that. Um, and I mean, challenged individual men and also wrote really the first full length treatise on, um, on feminism in this country, you know, predated by five years, the organization of the Seneca Falls movement. Um, and so I was really intrigued by Fuller as laying the kind of philosophical foundation for women and specifically women intellectuals to kind of jump off of. So um, I found transcendentalism to be an interesting site for that, not only because I had been, you know, led to Brooke Farm and led to exactly. Margaret Fuller, but they, but because of what you said, they're really, they're trying to philosophically tease out, you know, 
what is the individual self and what is our relationship to the universe? And um, I think the answers to that or the, the dilemma in trying to work that out was definitely different for men than for uh, women who were living in that moment in that time. Yeah. And, and also let me, let me sort of give Margaret Fuller her due that you know, <laughs> like she was trained from a very, very young age by her father to have this mm -hmm. very rigid education that was very unusual for women of that time. Right. So she was, she was known to be the most well-read woman of her day and probably more well-read than like most of the men that she knew. And Definitely. You know, yeah, and, and men were sort of trained for this whole intellectual pursuit and, you know, the world of the mind and business and being out in society and women were still trained with, you know, like learning how to sew at home and you know, that's <laughs> right. Enough, right. Yeah. And not and not offered any outlet, not only for their formal education, if they got it, um, because in that generation in Fuller's generation still, you know, like you said, she had a very rigorous education, um, but not you know, I mean, all the colleges weren't fully open and a lot of women, unless, unless you were privileged and had that coming from, you know, your home life from a father who valued education, a lot of women didn't have access. But um, we were talking about this with Julia Ward Howe and, um, and just thinking about intellectual women in that, you know, someone like Emerson, I'm, I know I like picking on him a lot, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, if you're thinking about, if you're thinking about like the, the transcendentalist, you know, intellectual center, I think, um, you know, someone like Emerson as a situated as a male in that society, he could come to a philosophical position where he rejected the ministry or rejected formal education. And, uh, you know, women didn't have that option. <laughs> they could not reject things that they were not even like, you know, allowed to enter into in the first place. And so for me, that's where the women's rights movement kind of crossed over with it. Absolutely. Because you have these women who um, you know, were heavily influenced by Fuller and taking her ideas and by Emerson and um, taking these transcendentalist ideas about self-culture and self-development and vocation and coming up against a society where you know, these women are also organizing and going to conventions so that women can have access to education, so that women can become ministers, so that women can become uh, you know, whatever Both. they want to be, as exactly. Margaret Fuller said. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. it's a really different situation than, you know, than male thinkers being able to say, oh, well, you know, that is not, you know, the path to a true self is, you know, not participating in this, and I'm going to reject this, and I'm going to do this, and yeah. So that's that's sort of where the um, the philosophy and the reform aspects cross for me in the women's rights movement. Yeah. Because all of these women that I traced that were um, influenced by Fuller, many of them who had attended the conversations, um, they were active as women's rights reformers. And they were more active in the women's rights movement than, like, I don't think we're usually looking for transcendentalists there. Right. Right. <laughs> we're looking for transcendentalists, you know, in the woods and <laughs> in their essays and in their, in their experiments, you know, like the utopian communities or like yeah. Alcott's educational experiments. You know, but we're not looking for them at, um, I mean, and many transcendentalists were prominent abolitionists. Exactly. Um, but, but what I found is like, we didn't look for them in the same way in the women's rights movement, so. Yeah, yeah, and, and one of the things that has come up in our book discussion group, and I think that you had brought it up originally, was that, um, so we're, we're um, the, for the month of June, we read Julia Ward Howe. Mm -hmm. And one of her favorite, one of my favorite books of hers is The Hermaphrodite. Um, and there's an article out there that compares um, her writing the hermaphrodite, which is like a, about, a, you know, the main character is sort of situated with one foot in each world of male and female um, and comparing that to Thoreau's Walden, where mm -hmm. he essentially has like one foot in, you know, in society and one foot in the woods. And he's right. sort of wrestling with the dichotomy right there as well. So like in addition to all of the reform stuff, I feel like Julia Ward Howe is also like, looking at things from different angles. And she was definitely somebody who was, you know, in the, she, she was a very intellectual woman until the day that she was married. And mm -hmm. then she realized she suddenly had gotten herself into this situation of expectation where her husband right. was expecting her not to do anything. And like, after he died, you know, or, or like e even during their marriage, which was a little bit rocky, she kept <laughs> you know, being creative and she kept writing. And then right. after he died, she also had this whole other resurgence of, you know, um, 
uh, of being able to to just be outspoken. So all of the things that we're talking about, like what is what is it what does it mean to actually become mm -hmm. somebody who's fully independent and mm -hmm. you can and fully to can realize their whole intellectual self. And yeah. she ultimately had a much more public reform career. Yeah, you know, she started participating in women's rights and in. Uh, free religion association she was at the concord school of philosophy one of the few women lecturers so yeah definitely after her marriage she had a much more public intellectual life but it's amazing that she i mean that she wrote that manuscript the hermaphrodite which was not published in her lifetime um, i mean it's amazing that she wrote it in, under the constraints of domesticity and motherhood and of her husband not supporting her efforts at all and it's amazing the ideas that came through in it that she was thinking about um, in terms of, you know, what would it mean to, you know, embody both genders and to sort of choose on a daily basis how you present yourself and what are the limitations and restrictions of, of both sides. And I mean, that's, that's what's so interesting, you know, gender is not just women's history. <laughs> I mean, I right, study, right. Um, I study women like, um, but, when thinking about gender and ideas, it's, you know, what are the restrictions on masculinity at that time? And I think, you know, you mentioned Thoreau as a comparison, and, and I think he was questioning the expectations for men as well. You know, yeah. he was, yeah. uh, that, you, that you devote yourself to some career or job um, that may be soul crushing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, he also rejected, for whatever reason, um, he, you know, he rejected the sort of domestic expectations of of men as well. And, yeah. um, you know, so there's a lot that could be unpacked there, I think. And I think that's what Hal was getting at because, you know, she could have written a straightforward sort of feminist, look at the restrictions on women novel, but she yeah. created this character who was sometimes a man and sometimes a woman and came up against the, the restrictions of both, I think. Exactly. And it feels like a very modern piece, yeah. especially thinking of, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the prominence of the non-binary discussion, mm -hmm. how it's come out um, and people are, are, you know, it, like it's no, it's no longer something that feels like it needs to be hidden. There's this marvelous, um, you know, independence and, you know, just being, being forthright about everybody being able to, to realize, you know, whatever um, and present, you know, in however, whatever manner that they want. And that's like this ongoing issue that she continues with in that, in that manuscript, as you said. Right. So. I hope, I hope more people uh, read it now that it's been, you know, published in the paperback and it's easily accessible. And um, I mean, I don't know how many people know about her, but I hope more people would read it. Cause I do think it's a very modern sort of sympathetic view yeah. um, that really gets at, you know, very modern ideas. I mean, they didn't have the 19th century language for this, but she's basically saying gender is a social construct. <laughs> right. And, and right. when the character's parents decide to raise him as a boy, they're, they're knowing that if you're dressed like a man and you go through life as a man, you have certain privileges, but that, but it's, it's, it's a facade, right? It's exactly. not. And, exactly. And so exactly. she's separating, you know, sex from gender, from identity, from sexuality. And we think those are very you know, modern contemporary ideas, but she understood that on some level already. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's too bad it wasn't published in her lifetime. So there could have been like a reaction or a conversation about it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I would, I would imagine that she would have faced tremendous backlash, but yeah. I think yeah. even in her later years, she kind of didn't, you know, she didn't care maybe as much. So right, it, right. There's been an yeah. opportunity there, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it's but it's I always find it really amazing when you go back, you know, 100 years, 150 years, and suddenly you're discovering things and you're like, wait a minute. Oh, they were talking about this. They understood that. And, yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's what brought me back to the transcendentalist women, uh, because, you know, they understood that as well. I mean, again, they were showing up, you know, to ask for, uh, you know, property rights and the right to education and, um, you know, right to a profession and eventually the vote, you know, these very practical kind of, uh, you know, legal and civil rights, but the women who were influenced by Fuller and by Emerson and transcendentalism, you know, they were also talking about what it means to develop a self um, right. and whether the soul is neither male nor female, right? And right. that they had the same position, the same relationship to the, the universe and to nature that, 
that men did that there was no difference between. I, yeah. I mean, so, sometimes 19th century writers get, um, they can be very essentialist in their language. By that, I mean, you know, th this idea that women are more spiritual or women are more moral or like that there's some innate like spiritual or moral qualities about men versus women. But at other times they kind of, you know, blow me away by stepping back and realizing, oh, this is because society expects people to do this. Yeah. Um, but realizing that it's socially constructed. Exactly, exactly. They kind of arrive at the table and they're unpacking their own like understandings and, you know, they're kind of like, wait a minute, how, like, how did I even get here? How did society right. get here? Like, yeah. really what is the most essential? So, yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> So, and, and I, I know that we wanted to also specifically talk about like the, you said the Worcester Convention of 1850, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I um, presented on for the annual gathering at the Thoreau gathering this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I picked Worcester because um, a lot of attention is paid, uh, rightly so, to the first, uh, <clears throat> the first organized women's uh, meeting in Seneca Falls in 1848. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 with Susan B. Anthony and I mean, sorry, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and uh, Lucretia Mott and uh, Frederick Douglass was there and Garrison. And that meeting was really important for sort of uh, having these abolitionists like have a realization about women within the abolitionist movement and that there were limitations and then they needed to talk about women's issues separately, but it was still a very localized movement. I mean, these are New York abolitionists and it was still, um, you know, they outlined some very clear resolutions and goals, but yeah. 1850. And, 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 yeah, and before we, yeah. So before we expand beyond that, let's talk about specifically like women in the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. Cause I think that that's not an insignificant point. Right. Um, I, I love the Concord female anti-slavery society personally. Mm -hmm which was started in, I think, 1837. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of like smaller um, women's groups specifically focused on abolition right. and anti-slavery um, throughout Massachusetts and, you know, in local towns. And it was, it was like an ongoing movement for a while. And I think that the, that Seneca Falls was maybe when people, when women were realizing, yes, we as women are able to organize, like not mm -hmm. only can we talk about philosophy and not only do we want to learn, but when we're it doing a lot of this work. <laughs> we're doing the work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, like I think that that, that that's kind of, um, that ties those two moments together where right. abolitionism sort of like births the women's rights movement. Um, and then of course, like later on, I think that there's like another split between the white women and, you know, right. and, you know, African-American women and, you know, formerly enslaved people. And I feel like that that's a piece that um, it, sh it shows how how movements can grow and then scatter and kind of like come back together again. And yeah, so it, it, I feel like it gets much more complicated later on. But but yeah, in 1848, I feel like it's still a good it's still a really good moment, you know. Yeah, and you're exactly right, because between the throughout the 1830s and 40s, the, that was, you know, women's involvement, white women's and black women's involvement in the North in abolitionist groups was, they were popping up everywhere. I mean, there are all these local societies and women were very active throughout the 1830s and 40s in abolitionism. Um, and so in some ways, Seneca Falls is like the culmination of that connection um, and not just the beginning, but you're right. This is a long history of intertwined movements women's rights direct comes directly out of the abolitionist movement. I mean, if all of those women had not been going to meetings and reading the, and writing for the reform papers and you know, organizing petitions and organizing fundraisers, I mean, they learned how to be reformers and activists in the abolitionist movement. Um, and, and that history stays intertwined, you know, the, the connection between women's rights and black civil rights Mm -hmm. through the end of the 19th century, through conflicts and division, you know, over who's getting rights when, <laughs> and in, and all the way to the 1960s, when like a new black civil rights movement gives birth to a new feminist movement as well. I mean, it's, it's right. like the historical pattern is, is recreated. Uh, you have young women and students who were working in the uh, voter registration drives and in the black civil rights movement and the freedom summers. And those are 
the women, you know, mostly white women who step back and say, hey, yeah, we're also not <laughs> having our rights. <laughs> and, and so you have like a new feminist movement. So yeah, that connection is like really historically strong. Yeah, like I, I always picture that that image of Angela Davis and um, Gloria Steinem with their fists mm -hmm. raised together. Oh, right, right. You know? And I'm trying, like, and I think back like a hundred years earlier, it was kind of like, you know, there's, there's Margaret Fuller. And like, if they had, if they had photographs back then, I'm <laughs> the fist raised photograph of, yeah, like some kind of photo op or whatever, you know, <laughs> right. Um, with, with, uh, you know, Sojourner Truth or, or somebody who was, who was in essentially the same circles that, that right. Was, right. Yeah. Yeah. And they were, you, you know, they were closely aligned with, like I said, men like Frederick Douglass, um, it was always right in the center of the women's rights activity as well because they were they were friends in the abolitionist movement and the causes were connected as far as who has who gets rights and what democracy means but you have women like stanton and mott who you know are very active as abolitionists and they they reach this breaking point where you know i mean the famous story is about the london world anti-slavery convention in 1840 stanton and mott are there and the women have to sit in a different area, right? They're not allowed to sit on the main floor. And, and you come back to the United States and it's like, uh, you know, women, like I said, can do the fundraising and the organizing and the, and the signature gathering, but they can't write the editorials or they can't speak at the conventions. And, yeah. and you know, so various forces come together to, for the women to say, okay, we need to talk about, you know, the fact that women can't get education, they lose their rights when they're married. So they outline all of these things. They don't have the vote. It's the first time the vote um, is really mentioned as an organ by an organized group at Seneca Falls. But to get back to Worcester, um, so Seneca Falls happens, and again, it's still very localized. It gives some organizing principle to like what a women's movement would be about. Mm -hmm. But two years later, in 1850, um, the first national women's convention is held, and it's in Massachusetts. Um, it's not in New York. <laughs> I mean, New York gets a lot of the glory of the early women's rights movement. Um, so the first national convention, a, a call goes out and says women from, you know, or, or allies from all the states and cities yeah. Yeah. come to Worcester. It's October, 1850. And so, um, and Paul, and not only is it in Massachusetts, but the president of the Worcester convention is a woman, Paulina Wright Davis. And she is, um, she is a fan of Margaret Fuller. I mean, she's a transcendentalist who, you know, doesn't go stomping around calling herself a transcendentalist. She's not always- I um, did, frankly. You know? <laughs> I, I know, I know, but I feel like there's still this idea of like, you know, who the transcendentalists are. Like she didn't live in Concord. Um, she was, you know, she was from Rhode Island. She lived in New York. Now she's in Worcester. I mean, she was just kind of everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she, I, I'm never big on like who's in and who's out. I'm kind of like everybody comes to the party, you know. I know, I know. Oh well, are you a real transcendentalist? I mean, oh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Let's see your ID card. <laughs> exactly. exactly. But I, I identified and became with and um, and became familiar with Paulina Wright Davis uh, because she. So she's the president at Worcester, which is the first national convention. Everybody comes there. But because it's in Massachusetts, it's heavily attended by many who are in that transcendentalist circle, um, uh, including Emerson, who puts his name to their call. And Paulina Wright Davis, for years, she was trying to get Emerson to like speak and, and give his name yeah. to the movement. And that's kind of a whole other story. But um, I locked into Paulina Wright Davis because two years after the Worcester Convention, she founds a women's rights newspaper called the UNA. Yay. And, and there, and the UNA is, um, and Phyllis Cole and I have been saying this for years and trying to, you know, get it attention, is a transcendentalist newspaper. Um, Paulina, Wright, Paulina Wright Davis and this other woman, Caroline Dahl, who also had uh, known Margaret Fuller. I mean, these women were a little bit younger than Fuller. They had been very young, like mm -hmm. when Fuller was doing the conversation, but yep. they moved in the same circles. Um, and so they start this paper, the UNA, and and other um, like other papers and other women's rights activists call them our transcendentalist sisters over at the UNA. I mean, they see it as a transcendentalist project because it's very philosophical. It's a way to promote Fuller's ideas. Um, it's a way to bring those ideas into their current 
you know, analysis of women's status in the 1850s. Um, and, and so anyways, I'm just kind of making these connections that like, here's a, here's, here's probably the most prominent feminist transcendentalist project after Fuller, right? Uh, the founding of the UNA yeah. and the people involved in the UNA, she was the president of the first national women's rights convention. Yeah. Um, and so what I wanted, what I had to say about Worcester was, um, you know, first of all, last year, 2020 would have been the 170th anniversary. And, and so identifying Worcester as kind of the real start of a national women's rights movement yeah. and, and seeing this like very unique perspective that someone like Davis brought to the convention. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's really all- funny again, to see like who the people involved, who the people that signed their calls who the newspapers reported on as being there um and there's um yeah there's a lot of uh, a lot of transcendentalist interest in that convention specifically and the the national women's rights movement goes on there's there's another conference in 1851 they start having annual conferences and i think the 1851 one um was still in worcester or maybe it was 1852 and then they you know, they have one in Ohio, they have one in New York, they start having them in different places every year from 1850 up to the Civil War, some disruption with the Civil War. And then I think there's a couple more after the Civil War before the women's movement reorganizes and splits and focuses on the vote. So yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of interested in this alternative origin story <laughs> yeah, national women's movement and the role of transcendentalist women in that movement because like I said, usually the focus is on New York reformers for the most part. (laughs) And I think something different was happening in Massachusetts. (laughs) Yeah, well, and and also the whole idea that um, in the Civil War that Mm -hmm. a lot of the abolitionist uh, uh, groups kind of either fall apart or they're, you know, like William Lloyd Garrison had uh, been printing the, the, um, what is it, the Liberator? Mm -hmm. I think his newspaper and yeah. he stopped publication as soon as the emancipation proclamation was um, right. sort of made public. Cause he's like, Oh, our work is done. And mm-hmm. I think that he, you know, that was like, he called it a little, <laughs> early, right? it didn't quite he called it a little early. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. wait and see how this all shakes out. Uh, right. William right. Lloyd. <laughs> yeah, because I and I, I, you know, I, I, um, I think that it's very funny that the story gets told that way, where it's kind of like, all right, and and uh, like all of the um, emotion, and anytime a war comes on, you know, the national scene, everything right. gets disrupted. So, like, to but I'm really happy to hear that, like, yeah, there might be like a few interruptions in the meetings during the Civil War, but (laughs) they They try to keep going. Yeah, exactly. We're not going to go back to like just creating, um, you know, bandages and, you know, knitting socks for soldiers, right? Right, right. You know, we're not going to be shoved into the corner again. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting because my current project, I won't go too much into that, but I'm doing a project now on the on the final years of the suffrage movement, like in the 1910s. Mm-hmm. And there's another war and the suffragists are told, you know, that they are unpatriotic because they are demanding rights in the middle of World War One, yeah. And they're, you know, they, they, they're accused of treason. And anyway, so the, the civil war was very disruptive to the women's movement, uh, but Stanton and Anthony, I mean, they didn't take no for an answer on anything. Like they just, you know, so even during the war when those national conventions didn't happen, um, Stan and Anthony pivot really quickly (laughs) to use a 2021 term uh, (laughs) to, uh, like you were saying, you know, once the Emancipation Proclamation and once the war is in full force, you know, they pivot um, and by the end of the war, they they create the Equal Rights Association and, and they're trying to like abolitionist movement might be over yeah (laughs) and and it is over by 1865 and so you know they're very anxious to initially to keep that connection between black civil rights and women's rights Mm -hmm. and so the um the american equal rights association they found and again frederick Douglass is involved and and other black activists i mean it's it's male and female and black and white reformers kind of like okay you know once abolitionism is achieved like we have to keep pushing for the civil rights that come after that. And that includes rights for uh, the formerly enslaved and for African-Americans in general and for uh, women. 
Yeah. And so, well, you know, there is that moment good. where they're like responding to the times, but then when black men get the vote in 1870, that falls apart for Stanton and Anthony. They just, they cannot fathom that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and I, I so I was going to insert like one of the one of the events, and this is like Ellen Garrison, who is, mm -hmm. you know, an African American, um, you know, citizen of Concord, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, and she's she's born I think five years after Henry David Thoreau, and after the Civil War, she specifically goes down south to teach formerly enslaved people how to read. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and at one point she's actually in a Baltimore train station and she's asked to move out of the waiting room, you know, and then she, oh, yeah. yeah. And then, so she brings that whole thing um, actually to court um, because she's actually trying to, trying to use one of the laws that was very recently passed. And she's like, yeah. you know, this is, this is, it's illegal that I'm allowed to be in this room. And then right. like, so, so she's, she's known as Concord's, um, you know, like like one of the first, you know, the, the one of the first people to represent um, civil right. rights. You know, yeah, and it's yeah. and it's it's really amazing. But it's like it's little things like that, yeah. and you know, but to but make yeah. a civil rights claim and yeah. yeah, 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 and even when things are legal, it doesn't mean that things happen. You know, right, it right. doesn't mean that the culture has changed. Right you know, unfortunately. And well, and that's what that's what's so disappointing about the split in the women's movement. Yeah, like the Constitution changed. And yes, you know, sex, women were left out of the 15th Amendment, which effectively enfranchised black men. And and the blind spot for white feminists at that time was, first of all, what you just said, it doesn't mean black men are just going to live happily ever after and exercise their political rights. I mean, there's still a battle to be fought for um, you know, exercising those rights. And the other blind spot, I think, is like, what does this mean for black women? You know, and so to to sever that connection between black civil rights and women's rights. It, it there was a total blind spot about what this means for black women, you know, yeah. because they are both <laughs> exactly. and they have not They're acquired any right new there. rights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've not acquired any new rights, but they are heavily concerned with the treatment of the African-American community and of black men's voting rights and, uh, you know, lynching, which is going to be on the rise. And like, there were so many, there were so many ways that white and black allies could have continued to work together. And some did, um, but the split, you know, um, was along racial lines. And it was it was along regional lines in some ways. I mean, Stanton and Anthony represented the New York movement in a lot of ways. And it, it was Massachusetts women who, um, when the split happened in the women's movement, founded the American Woman Suffrage Association. And women, um, a lot of women from the New England Suffrage Society like joined that branch <laughs> and continued to work for black civil rights. Julia Ward Howe was part of that movement, Lucy Stone. Um, and so there, there were still some connections. I mean, the transcendentalist women that I study, um, like Paulina Wright Davis and like Caroline Dahl, who probably did more than anyone to kind of keep Margaret Fuller's legacy alive. Yeah. Uh, but Dahl was kind of a complicated figure. She supported women's suffrage, but she didn't join the organizations in the same way. And so uh, when, you, you know, when, you're, when you're doing this history, you can look at like who joins the organizations, who shows up at the conventions, who speaks, but then you, you have to like integrate, okay, but over here, you know, they're starting their own newspaper and they're focusing on doing that or they're working in education or they're, um, you know, they're continuing to work on these other issues. So that's one of my things with the history of feminism too, is that it's not just one thing and it's yeah. not just, you know, it's not just suffragists marching um, that there's a whole host of women's issues that stay important after the Civil War. And there's, you know, a transcendentalist community that stays coherent after the Civil War through the 1880s, really. I mean, yeah. after the death of Emerson and after the death of Alcott, um, Caroline Dahl at one point, I had this quote from her when she did her autobiography. And I can't remember how she lived, she may have lived into the 20th century. So, so this is someone who as a teenager, attended Margaret Fuller's convention, uh, conversations, yeah. active in the women's rights movement, you know, published and wrote about Margaret Fuller until the end. Um, and she called herself by the end of the 19th century, a, a 
a New England transcendentalist of the old sort, you know, <laughs> or transcendentalist of the old New England sort. Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, but, you know, by the 1880s, they're basically dying out. <laughs> right. But there's still the legend. I feel like that's also when like the legend right. part starts growing. Right. Right. So, yeah. Then people start, you know, writing biographies of, you know, I knew Emerson and this was, you know, life in Concord and, exactly. and all these memorials come out about everything. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we like to neatly divide things up and like, oh, the transcendentalists were active, you know, in the 1830s and 40s. You know, well, Emerson lived until the 1880s and they were doing a lot of stuff until that time. And the Civil War didn't really, um, I mean, it impacted everybody, but the, the Civil War is one chronological marker <laughs> right. before right. and after that's yeah. important for different reasons. But intellectually, like the transcendentalist movement continued well into the 1870s and 80s. Yeah, well, and and even like sort of beyond. I, I feel like yeah. like one of the reasons I love doing the Facebook group Transcendentalist 2021 yeah. is that <laughs> it's very like asynchronous thing. Every time I come across a mention in an article or right, like a right. figure on the periphery, I can just post <laughs> a link, and it doesn't have to be very neatly divided into chapters and stuff. And and actually, so right. can I ask you to pull out your your lovely lovely book, the Encyclopedia? of transcendental oh, yes Do you have that handy yes Just so because I feel like I'm so amazed that you were actually able to like cr to organize everything alphabetically into like one solid object because I feel yes. like that's that's the core of it but yeah like like it's it's very it's very easy to say but wait well what about this what about this you know it's like and what about this event and how did this impact right you know, women's rights and, you know, civil rights and all of these other things. So, yeah, um, yeah but like, I, but I love that book because if there's something that, <laughs> like I look something up if I haven't heard of it. If you have a person or a place or a newspaper or an event. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. I've been like, I grew up, you know, 15 minutes away from Concord and I feel like I know lots of it, but I'm right, still amazed right. at how much I'm learning every day. So, yeah. yeah. That was a really fun book, and uh, that was something, you know, a publisher came to me because they were doing this series on different literary movements, and they were like, oh, do you want to do the um, Transcendentalist one? And um, it was, I mean, it was just so great for me to learn as I wrote it, <laughs> yeah. because I was able to look at, you know, all the influences, like things they read, and then like the core of the movement, and then like you're saying, the impact through all these other writers and thinkers and poets and reformers and yeah so I really tried to gather all in one place like understand the whole networks of of transcendentalism which um, you know a major movement of the 19th century and as a major intellectual movement like it wasn't just in Concord it touched it touched on all of these other aspects of American cultural and, and intellectual life at the time and so it yeah, was really no, I, fun yeah. Yeah. No, I, and I think exactly the word network is, yeah. is exactly how, because it's not just a movement. It's not just like one, it's not just a town. It's not just a few yeah. authors. It's a larger network. And then, yeah. so wait, so can I also ask you to hold up some of your other books, like the Emerson one? Um, and, yeah. Oh, so, I just wanted to say about the Encyclopedia of Transcendentalism, oh, yeah. because I wrote it, I was also able to include like all my, uh, my women and their activities and you know there's an entry on the una there's an entry on caroline doll and i don't know i mean i hope if another scholar wrote it that they would have gathered all that research i mean it's just it's a work of synthesis it's like what have other historians and literary scholars written about um but i was able to you know include a lot of things that i thought didn't always get attention in the history of transcendentalism exactly and this is the same publisher so the book looks similar format but uh, this one was just about Emerson. Right. Um, and so this one was even more daunting for me because, um, yeah, it's the same publisher. Because Emerson, so. Emerson is daunting, yeah. <laughs> to, to anyone, right? Exactly. Um, like, I, I will admit that we did Emerson as our main author for mm -hmm. the month of February. And I think that might've been before you joined our book discussion. Oh, and everybody yeah. was sort of like, I think gobsmacked might be the word. because. <laughs> Some of it, it, like some people come to him and love him from the beginning mm -hmm. and other people need to like, 
be exposed and then come back years right. later. Right. Or sometimes it's just it's really it just feels very heavy because every every sentence sometimes feels like you right know, kind of <laughs> from somewhere you know and it takes a while to really process. It is a quote somewhere. He may or may not have said it, but there's an Emerson quote everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We just posted something like, t- like today or, or right, like some random quote. Where, where somebody's like, yes, this sounds like it should be Emerson. So let's just say, <laughs> but this was um, again, that same publisher, but I had not really written about Emerson. I mean, I had written about transcendentalism as a historical movement and I had written about Fuller and all these women who were bringing, you know, feminism together with transcendentalism. Yeah. Um, but for this encyclopedia project, like I had to read everything Emerson wrote oh, and there God. are other, other scholars contributed to the project. I didn't write the whole book. I was the, I was the editor and I probably wrote about two thirds of it. <laughs> uh, but I, I brought in some other scholars, you know, who specialized in particular things. Yeah. Um, but I read everything Emerson wrote. Wow. Um, and, and it was, it was, um, yeah, it was overwhelming, but I definitely, you know, I'm an Emersonian now, like I understand his project. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was able to make connections between the different pieces and in, it includes a lot of his poems, I think like 50 of his poems, which don't always get a lot of attention. Um, yeah. And it was, even in writing it, it was really hard to find scholarly works on individual poems. Mm. So a lot of it, you know, in consultation with some other lit scholars um, was like our own kind of uh, analysis <laughs> of the poems yeah. and and relating it to his other you know relating it in themes and things to his other works and yeah. but when you actually study Emerson you realize you know there's there's some wonderful biographies and there's some wonderful literary scholarship but um, this kind of tries to break it down like if there's a specific essay or poem that you're interested in try to give you you know a synopsis a connection with his other writings and and the publication history of it so yeah but no and 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 that's that, honestly that's great because i feel like the poetic side of the mm-hmm. transcendentalists is sort of um like like given less attention definitely in right of, like the philosophy and you know like like they're even they're a lot right. you know so yeah and other than other than the um the conquered hymn which is the poem that's on the bridge Minutemen statue. <laughs> Other than the conquered hymn, I don't think you know people think of Emerson as a poet, or they definitely don't see the extent of his uh, poetic output um, and how many poems he did write. Even though he published, you know, I mean, these are all published works, um, right. but I don't think people usually pay attention to him as a poet, except for the history poems. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you also have a book, uh, Women um, of the Nineteenth Century. Am I getting that title correct? Because yes. not, Margaret Fuller's book is Woman. Um, woman in the 19th century. Woman, woman yes. in, I always get, I always screw that up. Woman so, in the 19th century. So you have. I have women's women. roles in 19th century America. Yeah. And um, this was part of a series too from a publisher. They did one on each century. <laughs> so um, in, in American history. So they have like 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th century. And so they asked me to do the 19th century um, this is when, I mean, we can talk about my career path, but for many years, I was a freelance writer and editor and textbook author. And so I was not teaching during that time. So people are always like, how did you write so many books? And it's like, exactly. I, was, <laughs> I was working with reference book publishers to like develop and contribute to these series. And I mean, each book took like, you know, two to three years. So right. it was, it wasn't like exactly churning them out but I wasn't teaching during that time. <laughs> exactly. So, and, and you have yeah. a PhD as well. So like, I, I'm like, like talking about like right. paths for women, like yeah. you know, heavily, heavily intellectual career paths for women. It's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's once you get a PhD, it's not that you have to do academia. It's not that you have to teach. Right. You yeah. know, it's like there are, there are lots of other ways that you can, you know, follow your path and, you know, follow your, like, I'm a nerd. So like to follow your curiosity <laughs> and to go down the rabbit hole. Right. Well, I, and, and I mean, these publishers, you know, they wanted a PhD, like it, it's not that someone else couldn't do research and write. It's like, they wanted those credentials on the book. So it was a path that was open to me since I didn't go into a tenure track, track teaching job. But, um, you know, even, I can't even remember which one I did first, the Emerson or the Transcendentalism. I think the Transcendentalism one. Mm-hmm. Um, but even when they asked me to do that, 
you know, my first response, I was like only three or four years out of grad school. And I, I had published my book about feminism and transcendentalism. So they came to me and, you know, I still had that imposter syndrome yeah. kind of moment where like, what, I'm it. not a specialist on transcendentalism. I can't do that. And, You're asking me. Yeah. Yeah. And my advisor, I mean, this is like three or four years out, but when I told her about it, she said, uh, what else do you need to do? Like you have a PhD and you've written a book. So in the eyes of the world, you are the specialist on this now. and yeah. you're going to have to do a lot of research and, you know, get your facts right. Yeah, <laughs> but it's hard work. who but... else is going to do it? Right. You know, it's like, exactly. Exactly. we have, to, we kind of trick ourselves into thinking that, you know, we're not good enough to do this or that. Or... But then once I did that one, you know, then the reference book publishers were like, oh, you could do this. You could do this. You could do this. Exactly. So that's all I did for several years when I wasn't teaching was these kind of reference books. Yeah, but, I, uh, but back to this one, I'm really proud of this one. Um, I was a sole author for this one. And again, it's part of a series. So they kind of gave me an outline of like, um, basically everything to do with women in the 19th century and, you know, have a chapter on politics, a chapter on work, a chapter on religion, a chapter on family life. And so, you know, I was able to shape it around that. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's just a great synthesis, I think. And I've, and this is the one book that people have um, written to me and responded that they've used in classes or seminars, um, yes. because it's really like all in one place, kind of seeing how women's roles changed over the century and getting lots of stories about, you know, who's who of the 19th century. So <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, I love it. I, I, and it's very, um, it's very multicultural. There's, um, uh, there's a lot on the West and Native American women and a lot on, you know, African American women, not just in the abolitionist movement, but um, in slavery as well. Yeah. Um, and sort of just glimpses of all women's experiences in the 19th century. So it, it, I'm pretty proud of that one. It was a fun book. Yeah, no, and, and it's it's amazing that you can have, like, I feel like women, like, that is such a broad topic. Yeah. So, <laughs> The very Every exact. woman of a hundred years. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just, you know, just put it into a couple hundred pages and you'll be fine. But, <laughs> yeah, but it's not even that thick, right? I, I know, right? Um, but, but it's a work of, it's a work of synthesis. So, I mean, at that moment that it was published, it was sort of like, you know, what have all these other scholars written about um, and, and sort of bringing all that together. Okay. You have all these scholars writing about the civil war. You have all these scholars that are writing about moral reform or um, and, and so just bringing together all that work. I mean, yeah. you know, as, as an author, you're always like, as soon as something's published, you're like, oh, I could have included this, sir. And so um, it'd exactly. be nice to do an update because I'm sure there's been a lot of new scholarship that could be incorporated. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was going to say, so I, I think like, because we, we had focused on, um, you know, uh, slave narratives and, you right. know, like stories that, and diaries and journals that just get get discovered and published mm -hmm. and digitized and like there's new scholarship coming up all over the time right right especially yeah. in the past 10 years like there's a yeah. lot of stuff about native americans and like scholars are also being introduced to like new new data points and new journals and new right new right sources, sources. firsthand information so yeah. I'm really excited to see what it's going to look like when it when it gets updated and very, <laughs> you know happen. And... Well, there's no contract for that. I'm just saying in an <laughs> ideal world. <laughs> but, but with wait, unlimited so... time and a pretty big advance, I would do it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So any publishers out there? Yes. Um, yeah. And, and also, do you want to talk about the project that you are working on right now? You, you don't have to, you know, tell us any secrets or anything. But every so every too often, you you mention something, and I'm like, oh, that looks really good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no real secrets. I have a blog, and I blab about stuff all the time on there and on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> um, and there's always this moment of like oh, I need to stake my claim to this topic, you know, so that someone else doesn't write about it. But I mean, as a historian, you quickly learn, like there's an unlimited perspectives that could be brought on all kinds of topics. So yeah. no one's going to like steal your topic. And even if they had the exact same sources, they might write a different history. <laughs> exactly. All the books yeah. are Margaret Fuller, right? Like right. It's like, oh, another biography. And then it's like amazing. And there's plenty more to say. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But anyways, I'm working on, I don't know which one you're referring to, but I'm working on two projects right now. One, yep. a nonfiction scholarly project. Yeah. And then I'm also doing creative writing and working on a novel about a woman in the 19th century. 
So. Well, so the creative novel, the, I was talking about the creative novel. You're okay. welcome to talk about the nonfiction. <laughs> but the creative novel is about a lady, a, a female photographer. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. And it's, it's based a, on a person. And it actually has connections with transcendentalism. Um, <laughs> because, way. yeah, the novel that I'm writing and which I have, I mean, I have a full manuscript for this historical novel. I'm just constantly revising it and, um, and then hoping to get an agent for it. Um, but it is based on the life of Clover Adams, who was um, a pretty skilled photographer. I'm reluctant because everyone says an amateur photographer, you know, and as a scholar of women's history, I'm reluctant to always say women are amateurs because the truth is they just weren't allowed access to the professional organizations and right. training and <laughs> Yeah, and, so, and I, um, I've definitely seen some photos that you posted on Facebook, and I'm like, that's so artistic and so unusual, and yeah. like getting out of the studio and like innovative, like really early on. So, and and I don't know a lot about photography other than what you know, I like what I see, <laughs> but but other objective sources have said, you know, she was she was pretty um, skilled, and she stuck with it for many years, and all of her photographs are um, most of them, many of them are digitized at the Massachusetts Historical Society. So you can go to their website and see Clover Adams photographs um, and they house, you know, her negatives and everything. But so this is the 1870s and early 1880s. And Clover Adams uh, is married to historian Hen Henry Adams of the infamous Adams family. Um, he's the, you know, grandson and great grandson of presidents. Um, and so they are, you know, they're solid Massachusetts stock. They're very privileged. But I was intrigued by Clover's um, photographs. And Clover's personal life story um, is that her mother was actually a transcendentalist poet. And her mother was, um, I'm not going to get the name wrong. Her mother was Ellen Sturgis Hooper. Ooh, yeah. And she was um, a poet who was actually published in the Dial. Uh, by Fuller and Emerson when they were editing it in the 1840s. Right. Um, and Clover's mother, um, so growing up in Massachusetts, Clover had like very close connections. Her aunt was Caroline Sturgis Tappan, who is a very close associate of Emerson. I mean, most scholars say other than Margaret Fuller, Emerson's closest female intellectual relationship was with Caroline Sturgis. Yeah. Um, and so that's Clover's aunt. So she comes from this, you know, kind of transcendentalist family. Henry Adams comes from this very important Massachusetts political family. And then she becomes this photographer. So we have almost none of her written record, like very few of her letters, none of their letters to each other, um, no journals or diaries, but we have her photographs. And so I was just very intrigued. And then the other piece of the story is that her mother, Ellen Sturgis Hooper, um, died when Clover was very young. Mm -hmm. And so that was always something that haunted her and that overshadowed her life. Yeah. And um, in real life, I won't say how the novel is, but um, in real life, Clover Adams committed suicide by ingesting her photographic chemicals. And so oh the photographs become a way of kind of like, you know, seeing like um, the joy in her art, but maybe some of the also haunting images. There's almost no there's no clear photographs of her. Uh, um, and so, you know, kind of kind of just trying to imagine and recreate this life. Um, so yeah. I decided to write a novel well, about her. Wait, all the symbolism yeah. of, like, of that as well. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and she did a lot of beautiful photographs of, of women, of her nieces and her friends. And um, But when I found out about Clover Adams through the transcendentalist, you know, circles, through her connection with her mother, yeah. um, I thought, oh, wow, this is, you know, an interesting life um yeah. and they're just like i said there wasn't a lot of historical sources about her and someone did recently write a biography but it's mostly based on the photographs yeah um and it was a great analysis um and so i thought well that's already been done so may i'll just write a novel about her because then i can imagine you know her marriage with henry henry adams writes the autobiography of henry adams which is like this really famous text that a lot of people read yeah. it skips the 12 years of their marriage like it stops <laughs> and then he's like anyways fast forward 12 years <laughs> so he doesn't mention her at all or their marriage so I oh, just let my novelist mind kind of you know what yeah. was this marriage uh they were childless they never had children uh she put all her energy in you know why is that you know yeah. um yeah 
and we don't know. We don't know if it was, you know, that they just weren't able, or we don't know if they didn't have sex, or we don't know if they prevented it, or, or exactly. if there was a physical issue. So I yeah. started reimagining it. I don't know so far if it was like a good decision or if I'd recommend it because <laughs> writing a novel about an actual person, even someone who didn't leave a lot of written record. Yeah. Um, Henry Adams is so famous that it's it's been like a rabbit hole of like how much to really do I need to know about him yeah in order to like reimagine their marriage or her reasons for doing things and yeah but but I like I inherently like not only relate to but like I as an audience member and also as a creative person myself yeah um, part of one of the reasons that I love the transcendentalists is that I, you know, I write plays and I do theater. So I'm also like using quotes and using real people and putting them into, you know, things that I've imagined. And I feel like there's this very interesting history of like, you know, the, the fictionalized version of things that um, just takes people's names and, you know, and doesn't do any research and then turns it into something that, you know, people in Concord kind of laugh about or historians kind of like, those people didn't sleep together. What are you doing? You know? (laughs) And then, and then there are people who do fiction where they really respect their subjects right, and right. they, they research to find the very specific parameters mm-hmm. of, you know, like here are the landmarks of the story. Here is what we know. Right. So right. Let me just fill in stuff in between. And, yeah. you know, like, and like, I'm always, I'm always, you know, um, <laughs> Supporting like like people doing non-conventional careers and right, right. following their bliss when yeah. it comes to like stuff that they're interested in, <laughs> um, especially when it comes to just telling the stories of people who are on the periphery. You know, like we've right, mentioned before, right. right? Like these are people who might not have all the full documentation found, or yeah, you know, you're never gonna know like the truth of you know that yeah. marriage or those years. But you know and, the truth uh, that they existed, and these yeah. are the. This is what they produce. So the very fact that you have a subject and you have right. her art, her work right. to, to speak to. Right. You know, and like that, that I think is amazing. And like, I, I'm really excited to read, uh, to read what <laughs> comes out. And if anybody out there Thank is you. watching, like, yeah, <laughs> like, like do like, ha- like help bring people to life, you know, like yeah. follow, follow the things that you're interested in. Um, I feel like history has, history can be told from so many different perspectives. Yeah, and that's, by yeah. the time I kind of, you know, realized my role as a women's historian, um, as a historian, I've constantly come up against the the end of the paper trail, the lack of sources, um, especially when writing about women. And I mean, a lot of the women I write about are elite, white, Northern women, and these transcendentalist women that I studied, they wrote a lot, <laughs> like they left a lot of records. Yeah. But but you know that's been something in women's history in general that you know women don't always make it into the record or produce the records in the same way and you know then then you have this woman who it seems like the the circumstances of her life seem so tragic and so haunting and yet she created you know this art for over a course of multiple years and so i began to see it as a very transcendentalist project too that um, because of her connection And because she was like expressing herself through her art. And so I try to make this parallel between like her mother, who all we know about her mother are the poems she wrote and then Clover and all we have are her photographs. So I kind of, I use some of the actual poems and I write about circumstances of the photographs and I try to make some connections, you know, connections there. But Clover was very, very steep in, she didn't live, um, they lived in Boston and then they lived in Beverly most of the time outside of the city, but she was very steeped in all of that literary community. Um, and I think I was telling you, she, um, somebody was talking about the Emerson and Ellen Emerson and Ralph Waldo Emerson taking the Egypt Nile cruise after their house fire in 1872, I think. Um, and Clover and Henry were on their honeymoon trip through Europe and then on the Nile cruise. And they were in Egypt at the same time as Emerson and Ellen Emerson were there. <laughs> right, because they're all- uh, and, she, the and she did, she wrote about that in a letter to her father, you know, about worrying about the Emerson's house fire. And so there, so as a historian of women and of transcendentalism, there were all these just little connections that I wanted to, and the, you know, and I struggled for a long time with how to write fiction. Yeah. And I was in a creative writing group one time and they were like not satisfied with, you know, what I was trying to say. And finally, one of the other people, I mean, this goes back to, you know, you, 
the art that you create too. One of the other writers said, well, you know, you can make it up, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, my historian brain and my fiction brain like right. are fighting Categories. with each other. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I can make stuff up within reason. <laughs> within, within reason, that's the thing. Within this world that I yeah. know, do know about. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, 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 my, my rule is that I never want the spirits to be upset with me. Yeah. yeah. Right. If we're going right. to come back, I don't want them to be like, wait a minute. That, that wasn't the year I was born. I never, you know. Right. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. As far as, as far as like some of the framework, like you said, but also so many people have written about Henry Adams and there's a new right. biography of him coming out this year. So I'm kind of anxious to see like how that biographer talks about the marriage and talks about Clover or doesn't. Um, you know, because if he's not going to talk about it, why should they? But right? I don't, right, or doesn't, but I don't feel like, I don't feel like I can damage Henry Adams at this point. A lot of people have said a lot of stuff about him, so <laughs> if he comes off as not so great in my book, spoiler alert, yeah, um, I don't think it's too far off what a lot of scholars have found out about him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and again, he can probably take it, so it's okay. Somebody will probably be mad, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool. This this has been so much fun. I yeah, feel, it's I feel like nice. we've gone for hours and hours. So, uh, we just said, we have <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and so, just a reminder for anybody who has access to the um, Thoreau Annual Gathering um, that you've just done a fabulous presentation, a panel presentation, um, and uh, you know, and I'm sure that you're going to do it again and again and again. And I would <laughs> to, I would love to bring you back in the future as well to talk about more of your projects. So thank you. There's there's two panels from the Thoreau Gathering. There were two panels about women and transcendentalism. And so I am on one of them talking about the Worcester Convention. So yeah, hopefully more people can uh, take a look at that too. Uh, exactly, exactly. Yeah, like the first national women's convention. That sounds yeah. like something. That and I don't know if that's something I'll write more about. So doing the conference panel is always nice because you get to explore different topics. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. The, the annual gathering is a great place to talk. So I'm, I'm excited to see how the panel presentations turn out on Zoom and um, yeah. to have people submit <laughs> questions and stuff. So it'll be a lot of fun. Thank you. Cool. Absolutely. And thanks to our audience. Thank you very much for joining us on Concord Days. <laughs> <laughs>